Two men were freed from prison in North Carolina today after spending more than 30 years behind bars for a crime they did not commit. They're free because of DNA evidence. There's an epidemic in America's criminal justice system. The prosecution and conviction of innocent people for crimes they did not commit. Welcome to the American Justice Podcast. Your hosts, Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller, come together to bring you the inside scoop on all of the wrongful conviction stories, both new and old. It's not only about the innocent who have been in prison, but also the victims of crimes as well. No one deserves justice more than them. And now, here are your hosts, Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the American Justice Podcast. Where we talk shit. And we talk crime. But we never we talk, talk shitty crime. crime. All right. Hey, C. Derek, how's everything going with you this week? You know, it's going great. Staying busy, writing, trying to get the new novel finished. Actually working with the wife this time around. She's my co-author. This is uh, her first go at this. So she'll be needing therapy in the next few months. <laughs> Well, I'm sure that she'll do fine. She's coming from a very good foundation. What is the name of the new novel? It's actually a sequel to my Splatter Western, Starving Zoe. This one's called Tracking Zoe. Mm, Got to track her down. Oh, yeah. And, and actually, this ties into, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but it ties into the Texas Revolution. So, Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So I don't want to give away any any names or anything like that, but I'm going to take some liberties with uh, with some history there and play around see what i can come up with it's always nice to take liberties with history it is all right uh see derek this week we are going to be talking about the henry mccollum and leon brown case it's the case of sabrina buoy baba buoy now i've got to tell you this week's story came to me in waves waves of empathy waves of horror and sometimes waves of confusion Every time I looked deeper into the case, I found more information that should have been part of earlier research, which was very frustrating, and I wondered why the case felt so choppy. It was also as if some facts were being withheld somehow. Sometimes the information I found was even contradictory, so if you hear anything that sounds, well, contradictory, that's why. I'm as lost as you. We can be lost together. There are compelling details that beg for an overturned conviction, plus a helping of coercion and suppressed evidence that contribute to holes in parts of the story that are filled in when you hear about a key person's role in the crime. I know I've confused you already. I will try to reorganize this as best as I can, and maybe we can solve the puzzle together. Yeah, I've never heard of this case. Yeah, so let's hear the whole story. Two men were freed from prison in North Carolina today after spending more than 30 years behind bars for a crime they did not commit. They're free because of DNA evidence. The courtroom erupted in jubilation this week when a judge declared death row inmate Henry McCollum and his half-brother Leon Brown, who was serving a life sentence innocent of a 1983 rape and murder of a child. A North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission discovered evidence that cleared both mentally disabled men. Another man's DNA was found on a cigarette butt left near the victim. That man, Roscoe Artis, is already serving a life sentence for another rape and murder. At 9.42 this morning, Henry McCollum regained his freedom. How do you feel, sir? I feel wonderful. I want to thank God. And shortly after, an emotional reunion with family. First up for Henry McCollum, learning to live in a new world. While on death row, he was not allowed to open a door, turn on a light switch, or use a zipper. And when the family car prepared to leave for home today, there was one more lesson, how to use a seat belt. And then you pull it down like that and clip it into the belt buckle there. Lawyers who helped secure Henry McCollum's release say the family has no plans to seek compensation at this point, although that could change. There are currently 152 men and women on death row in North Carolina. 
This tragedy took place in a small rural town in North Carolina called Red Springs, located near the South Carolina border. In 1983, the town's population was about 3,000. Today, it's about 3,158. I guess some of those people have had some kids. So not much growth there in the last 39 years. Makes me feel lazy just thinking about it. Unfortunately, this tale begins with a gruesome, unthinkable crime that's harder to hear, but I have to tell you about it before we can focus on what happened next. As in any wrongful murder conviction, there are at least two victims. The person whose life was stolen and deserves justice, and the innocent defendant who winds up in jail and also deserves justice. In this case, Two men were wrongfully accused, so justice was not served for three people, not to mention the families of those involved. While I will introduce you to people of interest as we go, the story is really about Sabrina Bowie, Henry McCollum, and Leon Brown. On September 24, 1983, 11-year-old Sabrina Bowie walked to a nearby convenience store to get her mom a soda. Please brace yourselves, I warned you this was an unthinkable crime. As it was clear on a cool day with no sign of rain, a fact that will be of importance later on, sunset was at 7.11 p.m. When Sabrina did not return home that night, her family began to worry but decided to wait a bit before panicking. I mean, after all, this was back in the 1980s, so it wasn't really a big deal when kids didn't come home on time. Oh, my grandfather used to send me to the store all the time by myself at this age. In, and then you would the see 80s. a friend and then you would end up right. going down the trails. Well, and, you know. I was always going to get him cigarettes. Like they would, <laughs> they, they would sell my 10 year old ass cigarettes. And, you know, I had to get those back to Papa. Papa right. had to have his smokes, you gotta know. Ha- gotta have the smokes. Yeah. So, you know, I'd go screw around with everybody after. First and foremost, you got the smokes to Papa. That's right. Smoke them if you got them. All right, well, this was a small, presumably safe town after all. A day later, her father, Ronnie Bowie, contacted the police to report Sabrina missing. Uh, a, a day later? Yeah, no, exactly. A whole day. You know, I'm in no way trying to blame the family. I've never been in their shoes, thank God. But a day later? Like, I understand, like, okay, she's not home by 6 o'clock, but we'll wait till 8. But the whole the next day? Like... Well, we don't want to bother nobody. It's supper time. <laughs> right. That's my that's my North Carolina accent. Yeah. I'm 100% confident that if I had a kid, I would definitely report them missing much sooner than that. Well, but sometimes isn't there like, uh, well, and maybe this is a misconception by the media, but I know in a lot of TV shows and movies and stuff like that, they, they make you wait like a full 24 hours before you report somebody missing. So maybe that's what they were thinking. Maybe they had seen it on TV. They're like, you know, hey, our our 11-year-old girl's not home yet. She's been gone for four hours. Yeah, but the cops won't do anything until they've been gone for 24. I saw it on CSI or Law & Order or whatever. So we have to wait that long. Maybe that's what they were thinking. Yeah, you never know. But I'm pretty much uh, very sure that I would have not waited. Or at least, at the very least, I would have gone in and searched for them, you know, the moment that it seemed like they had taken too long. At least go look for them, right? Yeah, or don't send your 11-year-old to the store for you, lazy. (laughs) Right. I guess there's also the possibility, maybe even the probability, that it was already too late even by the time that they started to worry, but still. All right, to continue, four days later... On September 28th, the police discovered a girl's body in a soybean field near the convenience store where she was headed. Nearby, police found two bloody sticks, beer cans, and cigarette butts. Forensics confirmed that the body was that of Sabrina Bowie. When she was found, she was unclothed except for her bra and was pushed up near her neck. The killer had lodged her underwear down her throat and a stick nearby, thereby suffocating her. She had, of course, been raped, beaten, and left for dead. The town, understandably, was rocked by the news. It remains a heartbreaking tragedy to this day, unlikely to be forgotten anytime soon. What a waste of a promising young life. You know, this brings me back to the uh, West Memphis Three. You know, those three little boys that, you know, obviously had never done anything to anyone. Right. And, 
you know, who knows what they, you know, one of them might've grown up to cure cancer. Like you just, you have no idea th- what this uh, is. This is freaking brutal though. Like they, they, they took the little girl's panties off, right? shoved them into her mouth and then down her throat with a stick. Right. This, this is horrible. Right. The only thing I guess you can hope is that it was post-mortem because I would not want to think about Still, man, you know, this is brutal. <laughs> This again, I'm not laughing at at oh my god. I, I always quit laughing at rape I, of children. I, I follow up a comment with with a laugh a lot of the times. It just so happens on this podcast that a lot of the time we're talking about rape. I'm not laughing at rape. Nobody make the comment that C. Derek Miller laughs at rape. <laughs> right. It's just a lot of times just the ridiculousness of the situation. It's like, especially when you get into what like police are assuming happened or stuff like that. It's like, how ridiculous is that? But, um, all right. So what a complete and utter senseless tragedy, such a horrifying way to die. Any family, any town would be anxious to bring a child's murderer to justice. Who could blame them? All right. Let's enter local local law enforcement. Well-intentioned one would assume would be heroes seeking to bring a vile criminal to justice. Nothing could bring Sabrina back, but catching her murderer might allow her family a modicum of peace. The police started their investigation by interviewing local residents, looking for clues, witnesses, and suspects. Investigators went to the house nearest to the scene of the crime, which belonged to a man named Roscoe Artis, but they failed to run a background check on him. Are your ears pricked up at this point? Are you taking notice? Sitting on the edge of your seat? Spoiler alert, Roscoe Artis raped and strangled an 18-year-old woman in the same manner as Sabrina's killer while Henry and Leon were awaiting trial. Artis was convicted of that crime and eventually was investigated in Sabrina's case, but Joe Freeman Britt, the local district attorney, never told the defense lawyers about Artis. I guess he wanted innocent men to pay the price more than he wanted justice for Sabrina. More on Mr. Britt later. Notable for being listed as the deadliest prosecutor in the Guinness Book of World Records, he's a story all to himself. I mean, just that name alone, you know, in North Carolina, you know, the the picture that comes to mind is the guy from Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? The old politician. Yeah. You know, Joe Freeman <laughs> Britt. I'm Joe Freeman Britt, and I agree with this comment. <laughs> right. About the soggy bottom boys. And- All right. Well, the search for proof continued. One investigator interviewed a 17-year-old white high school student, Ethel Fromage, a so-called confidential informant, who repeated a rumor that she had heard. Hey, I didn't know good police work was based on rumors, but I guess if you look back to the season one. Yeah. Season no, that's absolutely American true. American Justice Podcast. <laughs> But Take you back. Right. I thought some kind of evidence might be necessary. Silly me. Anyway, Ethel said she had heard about Henry in school. She was told that he was from out of town. He had been in Red Springs for a few weeks visiting his family and seemed suspicious. Both 19-year-old Henry and 15-year-old Leon had intellectual disabilities. Henry's IQ was actually 51 and Leon's was 49. They both had been identified in school as mentally challenged. Henry read at the second grade level and dropped out of high school. Leon could barely read or write. This may have been why Henry was perceived by local teenagers as acting strangely. Speculation was probably fueled by the fact that the field where Sabrina was found was near Henry's family home, although Ethel later recanted, saying that she didn't know about the murder and had only ID'd Henry because he, quote, looked funny, her accusation was the first domino to fall in the case against Henry and Leon. And I hope she feels like crap. Uh, She probably doesn't, but (laughs) there was no going back now. When officers came to Henry's mother's house to question him, he voluntarily agreed to go to the station. State Bureau of Investigation officers Leroy Allen and Kenneth Sneed kept him in an interrogation room until late at night, demanding Henry tell them about the crime, purportedly yelling at the 19-year-old man with the mental capacity of a 9-year-old, calling him racial slurs and threatening him with the gas chamber if he didn't confess. 
while promising he could go home if he gave them the facts about the crime. They claimed there were witnesses. At midnight that evening, Henry's mother and Leon went to the police station to find out what was taking so long. When she stepped outside, the police took Leon in to question him as well. The brothers were interrogated for hours without a lawyer present. Par for the course, again. (laughs) Exactly. Finally, Henry broke and gave them a story of how he and three others had killed Sabrina, telling a story filled with details spoon-fed to him by the police. Hmm. Did the police ever investigate these other participants? Why, yes. They all either had alibis or lived in different areas. Score one point for proper detective work, but... While you're at it, deduct points since the police already knew that Henry was being forced to make up something so he could go home. The officers wrote up a grisly confession and Henry signed it. Henry didn't even write the confession. Like the officers wrote it and he just signed his name. Probably couldn't even read it. Every detail in the confession, including what Sabrina was wearing, the brand of cigarettes and beer cans found at the crime scene, the stick in Sabrina's throat was provided by the investigators. Of course, anyone could have predicted the answer Henry got when he asked if he could go home after signing the confession. In a death row interview with Henry by the News and Observer in August of 2014, he said, quote, I had never been under this much pressure with a person hollering at me and threatening me. I just made up a story and gave it to them so they would let me go home. But he wasn't allowed to go home. Meanwhile, the police, in a separate interrogation room, extracted a confession from Leon as well. He couldn't even read the document that they had written for him, but he signed it just a half hour after Henry's confession. The two signed statements contradicted each other in a substantial way. Yet, the coerced, conflicting, but patently false and sadly signed documents became the evidence prosecutors used to send two innocent, poor, black, disabled teens to death row. Now, here we go again. We're in in the middle of nowhere in the South, somewhere along the North Carolina, South Carolina border, where, you know, (laughs) these these small town people, not not quite, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put down small town people. I'm a small town person myself. But you know what I'm talking about. You know, they're very, very narrow-minded. You know, and they're they're always looking for a way out. It was the same thing in Hunt County in season one. You know, they they found the boy who was different, and it would be so easy to build a case around him. These guys just wanted to go home too. They wanted to go home with a pat on the back or a medal or or letter of, of commendation or whatever. So they, they got these two boys who were a little under par to confess. Right. Congratulations. Their job is done for the day. They get to go home and be the town heroes. Even if they did it wrong, even, even if the conviction was wrong, they got the wrong people. The town doesn't know that. Right. You know, Betty at the town cafe at breakfast tomorrow morning is not going to know that. She's going to say, well done, sir, right? and spit her tobacco. This reminds me of the Stephen Avery case, too, because it was his uh, nephew that was, you know, coerced into a confession. He was also borderline mentally retarded as well. Well, yeah, same same thing. And Wisconsin. Got to love Wisconsin. <laughs> We're going to be going back to Wisconsin we in are. a couple weeks here. Your Stories on Video is the perfect service to preserve all of your memories for generations to come. If you've ever thought to yourself that it's time to get all of those precious memories down on video, now is the time. Here's a quick sample of one of our videos. My name is Daryl Kaiser, and and uh, I was uh, born uh, in 1925 in uh, Canby, Minnesota. The happiest day of my life. It has to be when I got married. Yeah, that, that would have to be my happiest day. I uh, sat down in a, in, a, in a chair that was several chairs, and there was women on the opposite side. And I looked, 
a guy ordered me a drink and I and I looked down that way and and Betty was looking at me. <laughs> so I winked at her. <laughs> and uh, the next thing I know, I, you know, was, uh, then I went and asked her for a dance and we we danced and and uh, so several times and and uh, and then I asked to take her home. I can't say that I ever gets out of my mind at all. Darold hired your stories on video because he wants his grandkids and their grandkids to hear from his own mouth and his own likeness what his life was like. He also shared the family ancestry as only he could. Going back and researching archives are one thing, but watching the person that lived it is so much better. The process to get a video is very simple. Just go to www.yourstoriesonvideo.com and request a consultation. Then one of our experienced story consultants will work with you from the beginning to the end to make sure your video is exactly what you want it to be. Many kinds of individuals and families utilize our service, from the older generation wanting to pass down their wisdom to those that have an unfortunate medical diagnosis. Contact Your Stories on Video today at yourstoriesonvideo.com. Mention the American Justice Podcast and receive a 25% discount. All right, so conveniently, there is no recording of the unlawful interrogations, which was par for course at the time. I know. What about these golf puns, man? Aren't they great? <laughs> Does this remind you of the Vincent Cosey case? It does. Very, very much so. It, it reminds me of every single damn thing we touch on this podcast. <laughs> right. Although the brothers quickly recanted, saying they didn't understand what the confessions meant, the legal system pressed on. Please take note. Coercing a confession should never be the basis for probable cause. Such actions by investigators are a clear violation of the suspect's civil rights and liberties. It should also be noted that Mr. Allen had since denied yelling, using racial slurs, and coercing any confessions from the brothers. Of course he did. For, fast forward to the end of the trial. In 1985, with no physical evidence, a recanted statement based on a rumor, coerced confessions, and an excluded viable suspect as the backdrop to the trial of the two brothers. Henry and Leon were found guilty, and both were sentenced by a jury to be executed. At age 16, Leon became the youngest person in North Carolina to receive the death penalty. After the state Supreme Court ordered separate retrials in the early 90s, Henry returned to death row, and Leon's sentence was adjusted to life in prison. Having spent most of his 31 years in prison on death row, Henry would acquire the dubious distinction of becoming the state's longest-serving death row inmate. I mean, this is this is just crazy. We're, we're talking teenage kid who, who doesn't know anything and mental handicaps as well and probably doesn't even understand why he is where he is to begin with. Right. Everything is a blur. Right. And, and here he is getting famous for all the wrong reasons. Right, exactly. Well, on the advice of a fellow inmate who assisted him in filling out the paperwork, Leon reached out to the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission, and in 2014, the commission made a critically important announcement. New DNA testing of a cigarette butt found at the crime scene matched the DNA of someone I mentioned earlier. You may recall Roscoe Artis, the man who lived closest to where Sabrina was found, but whose background was never checked, and whose identity was never revealed to the defense team, even after he was arrested for a similar crime while the brothers were awaiting trial. Let's pause to take in the fact that Artis's 18-year-old rape and murder victim, Joanne Brockman, would still be alive if investigators had done their jobs properly in Sabrina's case. Tragedy upon tragedy. Shit rolls downhill, man. And one thing I also want to, to uh, talk about here is that the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission was actually um, started by another wrongful conviction of a guy named Greg Taylor, uh, who we will be talking about in a few weeks. 
but it was his case that actually established this uh, North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. So it's uh, North Carolina is one of the few states in the union that actually has a full statewide Innocence Inquiry Commission. Well, I guess so. because wrongful convictions had to have happened enough to where you would need something like that. Right. And I've actually been working with uh, a congressman here in Texas to establish the same thing in Texas. But uh, as you can imagine, we had more things to do in Texas in the last legislature, like ban transgender bathrooms. Right. And, you know, stuff like that. So. Tell women what they can and can't do with their own bodies. Yeah, stuff like that. <laughs> All right. Well, in September of 2014, a judge declared Henry and Leon innocent. Henry McCollum, age 57, and Leon Brown, age 53, spent 30 years, 11 months, and seven days in prison for a crime that they did not commit. The freedom we take for granted was stolen from them, and the justice that Sabrina Brewey and her family deserved went unserved. Imagine the pain her family felt when they realized the closure that they thought they had gotten was a lie and old wounds were to be publicly and brutally reopened. This is insane, man. And not only that, I mean, 30 years of these guys' lives completely gone. They they were incarcerated as teenagers. Right. So everything they pretty much know about life is incarceration. That's what they know. Someone telling them when to wake up, when to go to bed, when to go outside, when to pee, when to eat. Every, like, I bet these guys can't even take care of themselves properly. Right. And just imagine having to learn all the, you know, cell phone and computers and internet and all. Oh, know? I know. Like, it's crazy. Well, this is 2014. You know, they, they, get, they get out of jail and they're like, breathe fresh air for two years, only to be slapped after that with, you know, all the political problems we've had, the pandemic problems we've had, everything. It's like, it was like, well, we let you guys out of hell. Here's hell. Here's hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, aside from finally getting some justice, life outside of prison was a mixed bag for Henry and Leon. In 2015, after being pardoned by the governor, the state of North Carolina awarded the brothers $750,000 each the maximum allowed as compensation for spending 30 years on death row. You do realize that that comes to $25,000 a year, right? Is that supposed to be a serious attempt at reparations? Anyway, seven months later, Henry was broke. He started borrowing money at 38% interest, keeping his financial problems a secret. Much of the free money that they were awarded was siphoned off by Leon's sister, Geraldine Brown. Man, talk about a victim being victimized. Yeah. Who had visited Leon in prison once and never visited Henry. A lawyer from Florida and others, according to the Marshall Project, a nonprofit online journalism organization focusing on criminal justice. The brothers fell victim to predatory loans and dishonest people trying to take advantage of their mental deficiencies. The same vulnerability that led to their arrests, convictions, and sentences led to them being easy targets after their release. That's crazy. You know, that's that's something that we haven't touched on on any of these cases of these these wrongfully accused people spending all this time in prison and they've gotten, you know, they've, they've filed lawsuits and got reparations for wrongful convictions. How well are they doing financially after the fact? Right. This is and, the first time we've ever touched on something like that. Right. And one of the, well, the, the one that, uh, that I can think of was Ryan Ferguson who got $11 million. So you got to imagine he's still doing okay. I mean, that was only a few years ago. Yeah. So hopefully he's, uh, not squandered all $11 million yet. <laughs> and he did not win the Amazing Race. We talked uh, during the episode that he was still on the Amazing Race, but uh, they, him and his buddy uh, just basically head-flopped on the, on the last episode and came in third, like a distant third. <laughs> but they were doing so well before that. I, I've never watched a single episode of that show. Oh, it's pretty interesting. They travel all over the world in a race to get win a million dollars. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. All right. Leon was unable to attend the hearing that awarded his compensation as he had been admitted into a psychiatric facility for the seventh time since his release. 
He experienced psychotic breaks in prison, which intensified in the real world. He was haunted by his time in prison, having been raped by inmates and tied to his bunk by guards. He worried that he wouldn't be forgiven by God and often refused to eat or drink for days. You can take that man out of prison, but you doesn't magically erase his time there by a long shot. Enduring decades on death row took its toll on Henry. He watched dozens of people being taken away for their executions. When an inmate he'd grown close to was executed, Henry saw them cart off his body, causing him, understandably, to have a mental breakdown. He was so distraught he had to be put in isolation. He literally bore witness to his own future while simultaneously losing the precious emotional support of a friend. I can't even imagine to fathom how to recuperate from such deep, scarring trauma. Death Row is a place of suffering, angry, nightmare, pain. I feel like when that day comes, they're going to kill me. So, it kind of uh, messed me up in my mind and everything. I had ended up getting depressed, stressed, and all that. Because that's what death row carry. I want to, you know, let people know out there, hey, be human too. We don't deserve, we don't deserve to be killed. They feel like, they feel like they're doing justice by executing us. Mm-hmm. But what they don't realize, they are committing murder their own self. How would they feel if they was in our shoes? I mean, that's, that's like torture. Right. Is, is what that is. That's, I mean, wow. I mean, that's, that's like. That's Holocaust level stuff right there, man. Right. That's just And it's I think it's one thing if if you did the crime. Right. You know, to be okay, well, that's you know, that's gonna be me one day. I guess I shouldn't have murdered those eighteen people. Yeah. But uh, you know, but when you didn't do the crime and they're just like you know, holding this ominous death row execution carting off the body and right in front of you, like that's gotta be crazy. Well, Ken Rose Henry's attorney, who worked pro bono, had been visiting him in prison for 20 years. He said that each time he visited, Henry would say, I don't belong here. I'm innocent. When can I go home? Please put yourself in his shoes for a moment. How would you feel? Can you imagine? But as much as you might want to think, at least they're free now, we could do an entirely separate podcast just on the rough time that they've had outside of the prison walls. Thanks to Mr. Rose, an honest advocate, the brothers have gained some victories over the predatory actions of those that they trusted. Henry and Leon began pursuing litigation against law enforcement in 2015, citing the violation of their civil rights during the interrogations that ended in their convictions. An eight-person jury serving on their North Carolina civil rights case later awarded Henry and Leon $75 million. They each got $1 million for each year that they spent in prison, plus $13 million in punitive damages. That's a whole lot more impressive than their previous compensation, right? Yeah. <laughs> this would be the first jury to hear all of the evidence including the information about Mr. Artis, which certainly would have given any alternative jury from the first trial a shadow of a doubt. The jury decided that investigators Leon Allen and Kenneth Sneed had violated Henry and Leon's rights by coercing them into confessions. The Robeson County Sheriff's Department settled their part of the case for $9 million. The town of Red Springs settled for $1 million. And I bet those guys are not in financial troubles anymore. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Although if they keep get, being taken advantage of, I mean, you never know. I mean, you'd have to take all kinds of advantage of somebody to get to that $75 million mark. Well, they only got a, $11 million. Oh, did they only get $11 million? Yeah. 
10 million. The Still, sheriff's 10, department gave, settled for 9 million and the town of Red Springs settled for a million. Well, I mean, you know, these, these guys are what in their, in their 60s now. Yeah, so, probably. Yeah. Yep. I hope they're spending that money well. <laughs> well, when researching this story, I became curious to know about more of Sabrina's family and how they responded to the news of Henry and Leon's release. Can you imagine how they must have felt? Personally, I would want the real murderer to be punished, but that's what they thought had happened over 30 years ago, and there's never a guarantee of subsequent investigation being launched, let alone providing closure. This kind of tragedy is something that becomes a part of you. It scars you. Now the wounds were being reopened. I do think it's important to take a moment to think about their perspective. Tanisha Bowie, Sabrina's younger sister, said that her mind went blank when Henry and Leon were released so near the anniversary of Sabrina's death. Seated with her parents, Ronnie and Brenda Bowie, her brother and a friend, she remembers hollering, No! as the Superior Court Judge Douglas Sasser declared his ruling to set the brothers free. Although the discovery of DNA evidence that exonerated them and pointed to someone else is a justifiable enough basis for the judge's decision, it was still upsetting for Tanisha and her family. It kind, quote, it kind of leaves me feeling like justice doesn't exist or respect, she said. It definitely didn't help to wonder where the DNA evidence suddenly came from and why it was separated from the case file. Why, indeed. It was unbearable for the family to relive the murder investigation. Quote, it's the worst nightmare you could ever imagine, Tanisha said. Her parents have been through enough. They didn't deserve this. She didn't deserve this. End quote. Who can argue with that? Not this guy. And then there's an understandable fear that Tanisha expressed, quote, it feels like hell. It feels like I'm trapped in hell and can't get out because I'm wondering now, Will she be forgotten? End quote. Sadly, I was unable to find any information on whether Roscoe Artist was ever convicted for Sabrina's murder. I know it was looked into back in 2015, but that's as far as I was able to find with the progress of the investigation. Maybe Tanisha's fear came true. It does seem common in cases like this that once your main suspect is exonerated, not much effort is put into finding the real killer. In this case, it wasn't like starting from the drawing board, so I remain frustrated that the family may never have closure. The Bowie family still believes that Henry and Leon are connected to Sabrina's murder. Yeah, but this also, to me, sounds like this uh, Tanisha Bowie is kind of trying to make it all about her, too. The oh, woe is me. Charla Bowie? Charla Charla Bowie. (laughs) Charla Baba Bowie. Baba Bowie. Well, you know, I think it's one of those things where if you believe something for 30 years and, you know, you go on believing that this person killed your sister or whatever for 30 years, it's just really hard to accept that the quote unquote justice that you thought you had for 30 years was never true. So Tanisha's memories and input do add a spin to the narrative, though. She says that she never knew Roscoe artists existed. She said, quote, we never knew him and we never even went on that street, end quote. She said the last time that she saw Sabrina was in the front yard of their home. Sabrina was going to return Leon's bicycle and be right back. This is an example of one of those conflicting pieces of information that confuses me since it was said earlier that she'd gone to the store to get her mother a soda. Quote, she said in the yard she'd be right back but she never came back, Tanisha remembered. Now, keep in mind, Tanisha was four years old at the time. She said she was that she cried at the funeral, wondering why she'd never seen her sister again. She still has nightmares about not being able to go to Sabrina in time. Quote, they, the DA's office, promised they wouldn't forget her, Tanisha said. I'm just hoping that they keep that promise. I've seen cases where the person is just forgotten. The person mattered. There was some person's child. She, Sabrina, should not be forgotten. End quote. Amen to that, Tanisha. You're not alone in expecting someone to pay for what happened to your sister. 
As for Henry and Leon's reaction to the day that they were given their freedom, naturally, they and their family were thrilled. Some gasped and some sobbed as the judge announced his decision in court. Leon smiled and shook his lawyer's hand. Henry just looked exhausted and relieved. Henry's father was quoted as saying, quote, We waited years and years. We kept the faith. End quote. I also find it incredibly bittersweet and compassionate that after all he's been through, Henry has been quoted as saying, I've got my freedom. There's still a lot of innocent people in prison today, and they don't deserve to be there. I'd like to take a moment now to delve a little bit deeper into the other two key players in the story of Henry, Leon, and Sabrina. I'm guessing you might be as curious as I was to learn more about Roscoe Artis, the man with the history that was hidden from the defense team. Although, as I said earlier, I don't know how the DA handled Sabrina's case after Henry and Leon were freed, but there are some interesting details surrounding him that you might be interested in. I'm telling you about it now, rather than in the recounting of the crime, investigation, and trial, because I want you to be struck by the information that was excluded and could have had a huge impact on Henry and Leon's case and justice for Sabrina. So, Roscoe Artis. Roscoe Artis, the man who was convicted of murdering Joanne Brockman in a similar fashion as Sabrina, less than a month apart, while Henry and Leon were awaiting trial. An inmate of the Warren Correctional Institution, he was sent to death row, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison in 1991. Roscoe Artis, who had a long record of serious assaults against women, it turns out he had some things to say. Oh, yes, by all means. I would love to know what this guy has to say. <laughs> this is the same guy that took an 11-year-old girl and stuffed her panties down her throat with a stick. Right. I don't care what this guy's got don't to say. Don't care, right. Well, enter Sharon Stellato, the Associate Director of the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. Remember, it was Leon who wrote to the commission asking for help. Sharon took the case and interviewed then 74-year-old Roscoe three times from prison and said that he was able to offer specific details about the case. Sharon testified that DNA on the cigarette butt found at the crime scene pointed to artists, a fact that contradicted the prosecutor's case during the original trial. In fact, she found that none of the evidence from the crime scene Beer cans, matchsticks, cigarette butts matched Henry or Leon. Even the rape kit that was done didn't trace back to them. Sharon wanted nothing more than for Sabrina to rest in peace, which she couldn't do as long as her true killer was never held accountable. At first, Roscoe told Sharon that he didn't know Sabrina, but later he said she would come to his house and buy cigarettes for him. He said he saw Sabrina the night that she went missing, and he gave her a coat and hat because it was raining. That was his excuse for why his DNA may have been found at the scene. You know, (laughs) leave that alone. What about this 11-year-old girl coming to your house on a regular, semi-regular basis is creepy to begin with. Yeah, to to buy cigarettes, too. (laughs) Hey, old man, you got some smokes for me? Same thing you were saying earlier. Like, she would, oh, I thought, was it saying that she would go buy cigarettes for him or she was buying cigarettes as an 11 year old girl? I, I think she was probably buying cigarettes for him. Oh, okay. But you live you live so close to the convenience store, you lazy bastard. Go get them yourself. <laughs> right. You're the closest house to the store. <laughs> All right. Well, that was his excuse for why the DNA may have been found at the scene. Coincidentally, When I first began researching this case, I found myself wanting to know what kind of day it was just to get a feel for any details that I could find. Remember, I told you in the beginning that it was a clear, cool day with no sign of rain. It actually took me a while to find a useful site that provided the historical weather information I wanted. I took a leap of faith and what I had found was correct. And it turns out, it was. Sharon confirmed that the weather records did not show any rain for the night of Sabrina's disappearance or even the next day. Seems like old Roscoe may have told a fib. 
But what seems most interesting to me is that Roscoe repeatedly told Sharon that Henry and Leon were innocent. Makes you wonder how he would know that, doesn't it? Sharon said Roscoe never confessed to killing Sabrina, but insisted the brothers didn't do it either. He said that she was alive when she left his house and he never saw her again. I don't think I believe him. Do you? I don't either. And, you know, this guy's <laughs> already in his mid 70s, like with life in prison. Like, why not just give it up? Yeah, just, just, just confess, you asshat. <laughs> exactly. Well, Roscoe was wanted for the rape and murder of a girl in Gaston County when he moved to Red Springs in 1983. I guess he thought it was his next best move to keep raping and killing as a way of keeping a low profile. Hey, nobody has accused him of being a clever man, and to my knowledge anyways. He also had an assault record dating as far back as 1957. Don't forget, he lived within feet of where Sabrina's body was found yeah i don't think that's coincidence either you know you've got this this guy he's got a really violent history he's he's wanted for all these crimes and then you know next thing you know there's there's a dead murdered raped little girl in his side yard and he's like oh where'd that come from i had no idea well when joanne brockman went missing on october 22nd 1983 witnesses said they had seen her with roscoe He confessed that night and helped lead police to her body. While serving time, Roscoe confided in a former death row inmate who said he had told him that Henry and Leon were not involved in Sabrina's death and that he was able to describe the crime scene. The inmate said Roscoe seemed burdened with guilt. Additionally, this inmate knew Roscoe prior to his incarceration. How how is that even possible? You know, because... Well, Every, it was a small town. Well, it's a small town, but the but the prison that he went to was probably nowhere near the town. I mean, you know, you think ab- about people here in Texas who get incarcerated into a prison. They're they're never anywhere near where they're from. You know, you look how far Brandon is from here. You know, yeah. it's But he's also told me that he's talked to people that were from Rockwall and from like that area in you know, when you have a county that's committing, you know, or convicting innocent people there's probably a lot of people from that county in in prison yeah but these these, <laughs> these guys just you know they they knew each other before they were incarcerated hey, <laughs> hey let's buddy. go dude what's going on you were still raping and killing children yeah <laughs> well you know you remember that remember that little girl they found in your side yard whatever happened with that shit right <laughs> well of course roscoe nearly became a suspect in sabrina's murder but evidence of his involvement was mishandled by investigators. The Red Springs Police Department requested that the SBI compare fingerprints lifted from the crime scene with those of Roscoe in October of 1984, but no documentation of the order being carried out was ever found, and one year later, the request was canceled. Attorneys for the defense argued that the prosecution suppressed key evidence including a box of evidence found at the police department years after it had been asked to be turned over all materials. I just think everybody right now just needs to stop believing that all these official organizations know what the hell they're doing. Like it, it they're stumbling, bumbling. Like if, if one's doing it, then they all have statistically, it has to be this way everywhere. How many other people are being wrongfully incarcerated? How many other bits of evidence are slipping through the cracks? Right. Just statistically, this has to be going on often everywhere. Right. So just the the next time, like this is this is the best advice I can give to anyone listening. The next time that somebody with a badge points their finger at you for anything, I, I like I would have a tendency to not believe it more than I would believe it. Right. And I I would want to see like such concrete evidence of anything. But and but I know it's hard though. I, right. I know it's hard because we're taught from a very young age to respect these people. Well, right. maybe that came from a more respectable age. Right. Now you have so many, so many people who are just half ass doing it. Right. Like, you know, it's it's like you when you have surgery. Who knows if your doctor made it through medical school 
with <laughs> 90s or 70s. Right. The same thing could be with a police officer from the police academy. Do you think, how do you know he was either top of his class or he was one of the guys who almost washed out? <laughs> I mean, I, I. Is this true? I'm, I'm going to treat them all from now on like they're the dude that damn near washed out. Right. Well, the cigarette butt was the key to finding Sabrina's killer, but how many other prisoners have been coerced into false confessions? How many of them can prove their innocence? Just exactly how many innocent people in North Carolina or the entire country are still on death row today? Now, don't forget local district attorney Joe Freeman Britt. I mentioned him earlier. You may remember I told you that he was known for being the deadliest prosecutor in the Guinness Book of World Records. Neat guy, huh? I mean, what a distinction. 19 million people in the United States are against the death penalty. But even a proponent of the concept would surely not want innocent people to be put to death, right? Well, maybe Joe didn't want that either. He passed away in 2016, so I guess we'll never know. But let's take a real quick peek behind the scenes and the man. Joe was a flamboyant DA in North Carolina who was notoriously proud of his deadliest prosecutor moniker. He earned the title by winning dozens of death row convictions in his rural district. He became the DA in 1974, quickly gaining a reputation as a tough prosecutor in an area that included Robeson and Scotland counties. In the 27 years previous to his becoming DA, not one person in the two counties had been sentenced to death. A year after he took over, he had won more death row convictions than any other prosecutor in the country. According to Newsweek magazine, he was quoted in 1975 as saying, I'm not some hick prosecutor just railroading these people away. I don't like to use the word crusade, but I'm doing something I like doing that needs to be done. Those two brothers didn't stand a chance against this prosecutor. Standing at six foot six, his powerful, deep voice boomed through the courtroom. He would flourish bloody clothes belonging to murder victims in front of the jury and preach with a Bible in his hand like a Sunday minister in front of his congregation. I can just imagine it now. The jury would be awed by his performance, while Henry and Leon must have been shaking in their boots. In another Newsweek quote, Joe said, the poor victim lying six feet underground has nobody to speak for him but me, and nobody to hear his side but 12 jurors. All victims deserve a stalwart hero to find them justice, but a good hero is expected to have the highest of moral standards, especially when life and death are at stake. A true hero must prioritize the truth over the win, integrity over ego. It is not justice for the victim he advocates for if the accused is innocent and the murderer goes free. Well, let's talk for a second about the great state of North Carolina here. Uh, rather than praise this prosecutor for the number of times he's been able to give people the death penalty, why don't we wonder why there are so many crimes being committed <laughs> that warrant the death penalty? Let's, you know, shit rolls downhill. Yeah. You know, yes, you're, you're dishing out this death penalty all over the place. We're proud of you. Wait, con you know, congratulations. But why are the citizens of your county, why are so many of them deserving of the death penalty? What is causing them all to commit crimes that are deserving of the death penalty? Let's, let's start there. If you put out the fire at the base, you don't, you don't pee on the flames at the top. That's just how it works. Well, and you also got to think about that if he is convicting this many people, how many of them, you know, is he just getting convictions, as as we said earlier, to get the win and not justice? So you never know how many people are actually not deserving of even being in the courtroom in the first place. Yeah, like these exactly. Guys. Interestingly, Joe Britt campaigned against the death penalty while he was in college. It was only after becoming a DA that he changed his mind. He led training sessions around the country to teach other prosecutors how to win convictions, like was Coercion 101 the first class? 
In an episode of CBS's 60 Minutes, he said, go after them and tear that jugular out. And tear he did. He won 47 death sentence convictions over the course of his career. I wonder how many of those convictions were achieved through shady means. Only two of the 47 were actually put to death. Court rulings, appeals, and overturned sentences, like in the case of Henry and Leon, saved the other 45. Yeah, but did they have to even go through that kind of trouble to begin with, though? Right. It's, if it, it's unnecessary if you just do it right the first time. Exactly. Well, in 1983, a study focusing on justice in rural America found that Joe Britt's control and influence over the courts in Robeson and Scotland counties led to a, quote, a widespread and serious denial of the rights of poor defendants. Bails were set at unreasonably high amounts, according to the study, and the court docket, which Britt himself set, caused defendants to have to wait for weeks before their cases were heard. He prosecuted minority defendants at a much higher rate, and many of them were told that they would have to repay the state if they asked for a court-appointed attorney. Yeah, 1983, Southern gentleman prosecutor. You know, I, I can imagine him like all dressed up in a white suit looking like Colonel Sanders. Right, got the little... uh um, tie, what's that Yeah, called? I don't uh, know what those things are. Bolo tie? Bolo tie, yeah. yeah, some, yeah. With and a chicken leg in his hand. With a chicken leg and a little goatee. Later in his career, Joe Britt became a judge for seven years in the same court where he had once been chief prosecutor. When he eventually opened a private practice, wait for it, he became a defense attorney. <laughs> oh, my oh, God. Oh, the irony. Johnson Britt, who retired as DA in 2018, was honest about his disdain for Joe, his distant cousin. In 2014, he told the Times, quote, He is a bully, and that's the way he ran his office. People were afraid of him. Lawyers were afraid of him. They were intimidated by his tactics, and he didn't mind doing it in that way. And those 11 herbs and spices, sir. <laughs> Given what an intimidating man Joe Britt was and the fact that Henry and Leon could never begin to match him in a game of wits, I'm particularly impressed with the following portion of the trial transcript in which Henry held his own against the relentless prosecutor. Quote, Didn't that touch your soul at all when a little girl was down on the ground hollering? Mr. Britt asked. It didn't touch my soul because I didn't kill nobody, Henry replied. It doesn't touch your soul now, does it? Mr. Britt insisted. Because I ain't killed nobody, Henry said. I want to tell you something, Joe Freeman. God got your judgment right in hell waiting for you. <laughs> End quote. Bravo, oh, Henry. Bravo. Let let me let, let let me play with my impressions here and see what I can do here. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Didn't that touch your soul at all when that little girl was down on the ground hollowing? Mr. Britt asked. Because I ain't killed nobody, Henry said. I want to tell you something, Joe Freeman. God got your judgment right in hell waiting for you. Bravo, Henry, bravo. No, bravo is not the part of the quote. Oh, that's that's <laughs> that's that's you. That's us talking. Okay. Bravo, Henry. Bravo. All right. When Henry and Leon were pardoned by Governor McCrory, Joe Britt called the governor, quote, a damn fool for granting the pardon. Joe referred to the DNA evidence as, quote, spit on a cigarette. He felt justified in his conviction of the brothers to the very end. No question about it, he said. Absolutely, they are guilty. I mean, it's one thing if he really believes that, but another thing when an officer of the law uses tactics instead of truth and holds fast to an unlawful conviction in spite of the evidence. And now, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to present a few random facts for you to chew on. Some are head scratchers, if you will, and some are just interesting. Well, to me at least. I'm also going to serve up a little bit of summation of sorts. All right, number one, in 2010, the North Carolina Republican Party used the Brewery case in a political attack ad, putting Henry's mug shot on campaign flyers that accused a Democratic opponent of being, quote, soft on crime. Henry was used as an example of a brutal rapist and a child murderer who deserved to be executed. The Republicans never tire of showing us who they are. I guess we should believe them. No, never. Currently in North Carolina, number two. 
Currently in North Carolina, there are 135 inmates on death row. For every five people executed, one person has been removed from death row status. Exonerated men have served nearly 90 years on death row in total. That's like 20%, man. And that's not even including the ones that we don't know about. Number three, reliability and validity of Henry and Leon's confessions have been analyzed by the courts. Neuropsychologists have testified that Henry would have not have been able to understand the Miranda warning or the language used in the confession. Further testing showed that Henry had brain damage on top of everything else. So his ability to understand was very limited. So, of course, they're going to take full advantage of that. Just just to sweep this case out of the way, they're going to pick these two guys and just take full advantage of what was more than likely, obviously, a mental handicap. I mean, right. you're, not, you're not going to be able to walk through life and hide that stuff. And most of the time, you just talk to somebody you can tell. Right. Right. So in the state of North Carolina, number four, in the state of North Carolina, there has been 43 executions since 1976. Before that, there had been 784, which may include federal and military executions. Twelve innocent people have been freed from death row. Life without parole is an option here, if you were wondering. Number five, nationally, 19 states and Washington, D.C. do not have the death penalty, 40 states have not gone through with any executions between 2013 and 2017. In 2016, there was a 38% decline in executions compared to the 10 years prior to that. 159 innocent people have been freed from death row. You know, I don't want to get too political, but this is one of the reasons, uh, the main reason that I'm against the death penalty. I have no problems with, you know, an eye for an eye or tooth for tooth or whatever you want to say about it. But the fact that we're exonerating so many people on death row, like you just can't be 100% sure that you got it right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if I, I think I think the death penalty should remain on the table if you get a confession, like an honest confession, and they can prove that you are the perpetrator of this crime within a shadow of a doubt. Well, like, and, and this brings me back to what I've proposed is, uh, you know, to be the death penalty is you have two standards of guilt. There's proof beyond a reasonable doubt and there's proof beyond any doubt. So you should not be able, at the very least, if we're not going to get rid of the death penalty, we should at least have Proof beyond any doubt yeah, any that doubt. this person was guilty. Now that I agree with. You know, if you could get that, or if you even if you even get like an actual confession, if you can get that person to stand there in the middle of a courtroom and go, <laughs> "Yes, I did that," right. you know, and not not some some forged or fabricated written confession like we have here. Like if you can get if you can get a person to stand up in the middle of a courtroom and tell you, "Yes, I did this." Sure, I got no problem with the death penalty at all, right there. Right. For for something like that, I'd say hell, even speed it up a bit. Right. You know just what what walk, happened to good old fashioned hangings? <laughs> just walk them right from the courtroom down to the execution room and get it over with. Yeah, fire <laughs> firing squads, man. Those are cheap. It's it's a hell of a lot cheaper than. <laughs> right. Yeah, you don't want to use all that electricity. <laughs> or you know what you can do, and I actually uh, I I got this from a uh, I can't remember. It was a, it was a comedian in the eighties. Uh, it might have been George Carlin. Uh, God rest his soul. But, right. you know, uh, yeah, if you're going to continue to execute people, you know, at least do it with some style, make some money off of it, <laughs> balance the budget, you know, like, like have like a guillotine at the, at the top of a, a of a, a big board, like a, like a pachinko board, you know, with right. numbered uh, <laughs> buckets at, at the bottom and people could bet on oh, what God. bucket the head is going to roll oh, into. Man. And you could televise it during the, the Super Bowl, like at halftime. <laughs> And you know people could win a lot of money off of this. Yeah, and if you want to budget, balance the budget, and you just balance do like the a budget pay, too. Just do a pay and you, per view. It's a form, a form of entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> pay per view coming up tomorrow on the beheading. Who's going to be beheaded this time? All right, number six. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia pointed to the brutality of Henry's crime as a reason to continue capital punishment nationwide. I'm not trying to downplay the brutality part of this argument, but it would have been less embarrassing for his honor if Henry was actually guilty. And number seven, 
You know the phrase, as luck would have it? It was luck that Sabrina's actual killer dropped a cigarette butt at the scene of the crime. It was beyond luck that the cigarette butt had not been lost or destroyed, as so many other pieces of evidence in this case had been. It was luckier still that the police even picked up the butt in the first place. But the luckiest thing of all was that it was after over 30 years that DNA had not degraded beyond its usefulness. Too bad all of this luck took so long to surface. Number eight, I just want to share another Joe Brick quote with you because I'm perplexed by how this man thinks. In one of his training sessions for prosecutors, he said, quote, Within the breast of each of us burns a flame that constantly whispers in our ear, Preserve life, preserve life, preserve life at any cost. It is the prosecutor's job to extinguish that flame. Oh, please, may I? <laughs> please, may I? Can you, can you imagine this big Kentucky Fried Chicken eating <laughs> Colonel Sanders looking bastard with a Bible in his hand? Right. Within the breast of each of us burns a flame that constantly whispers in our ear, preserve life, preserve life, preserve life at any cost. It is the prosecutor's job to extinguish extinguish that flame sir <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome well, ass hat no matter how many times i've heard i reread that quote i'm still perplexed it's crazy i mentioned number nine i mentioned earlier that i felt a little bit confused when researching this case the facts i found were sometimes inexact and conflicting but the one thing i want to be sure that you realize is how egregious the handling of the case was by the police, the investigators, and prosecutors. In a nutshell, the confessions were coerced, and the DNA that was finally examined proved Henry and Leon were innocent, as I'm sure you remember. But there are other details I want to highlight. The defense attorneys never knew of Ethel Formage's conflicting statements. They never saw the results of a lie detector showing that a witness who accused Henry and had no knowledge of the murder. They were not shown a document proving that the state failed to follow up on fingerprints found at the crime scene, which were not Henry's and Leon's. What might have happened if the fingerprint comparison had been completed, like all good police work should be? Well, the real killer would have been caught, and Joanne Brockman would still be alive. Oh, and Henry and Leon would never have been convicted. By law... All of the documents I just mentioned should have been turned over to the defense team. Also, if you're a fan of this podcast, and of course, why wouldn't you be? You may remember me discussing the main causes of wrongful convictions in a previous episode. According to LegalScoops.com, the six most common causes are eyewitness misrepresentation, incorrect forensics, false confessions, official misconduct, use of informants, and an inadequate defense. So let's see. I definitely say the forensics were an issue, but in this case, it boils down to false or coerced confessions and a huge helping of official misconduct. You know, a coerced confession really is misconduct itself. It'll be interesting to see how often official misconduct is the path to a wrongful conviction. Stay tuned and find out. Or listen to everything we've done previously <laughs> right. and, and go, damn, those guys are right. Right. All right. Any <laughs> final thoughts on this case, C. Derek? This, okay, first of all, th this may be one of the more uh, brutal cases that we covered uh, to me because it involves a child. So far. I, I have, yeah, so far. <laughs> I have, uh, I had, have, still have, but, you know, they were young once. Three daughters. And I have a granddaughter, and I just think the horror as a parent of, of if, you know, something like this happened to me. And just also in the manner in which it was, was done. It's some, something about taking off the little girl's underwear and shoving it down her throat with a stick just will not get away from me. That's Right. I can't even imagine. No, that's, that's horrendous. And they, they found cigarette butts with DNA evidence on it, which... This wasn't something that happened quickly. The guy had time to sit there and smoke cigarettes. Right. This happened over a long period of time, and it's 
uh, I, I just find it very disgusting. Well, I'm going to tell you a, a quick story, a quick personal story. Um, that's not a fun story to tell. And I don't know that I've really even told anyone else, but when I first started, uh, as an EMT on the ambulance, my, the first time that I drove what we call code, which is code three lights and sirens, it was from a hospital in Frisco all the way down to children's medical center in Dallas. And we were taking a six month old that was literally beat to hell. You could not even tell. Her face was twice the size that it should have been. Her whole body was, I mean, it was one of the worst cases I'd ever seen personally, at least until I went to work for Children's Medical Center later. But um, it was one of the worst cases I had ever seen of a child being abused. And that, and I will tell you that, you know, a lot of people think paramedics and EMTs don't have emotions, but you know, it affected my partner and I really bad. Like we sat there after we dropped that kid off and we cried, you know? And, uh, so yeah, these, I, it's just hard for me to imagine, you know, a, what would cause anyone to do anything like this, but also b, God, what it would feel like to be that person or, you know, like I would just not want to put my myself in Sabrina's shoes and even really imagine what it felt like when all of that was, like I said, I, I hope that it was postmortem, but yeah. Who, who knows? I mean, there were, there were several times throughout my law enforcement career where, especially working down in the jail where people would come in for really horrendous things toward children. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I never saw the end product of that. You know, I would read uh, the police reports or the warrant or whatever and then have to stare at that person for months while they're awaiting trial. Uh, still, though, I, I couldn't imagine uh, just just seeing that. It's uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's bad. disgusting. It's horrible. All right. Well, I guess that'll wrap it up for this episode. I guess until next time. Always great to end on a wonderful yeah. note like that, right? Yeah. No. But, no. Everybody. Everybody. When you're when you're done with this, if you can, uh, go hug somebody you love, man. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, until next time, remember to stay aware, stay strong, and get involved. See you next time. The American Justice Podcast is owned and copyrighted by Atua Productions, LLC of Dallas, Texas. Your hosts are Scott Pogansey and C. Derek Miller. Atua Productions aims for this to be an interactive podcast where you, the audience, has a great amount of influence on the content of our shows. You can interact with us in several ways. First and most preferred is you can leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 972-942-0444. Be sure to leave your name and city you're calling from, along with whether or not we can use your voice on the air. If Facebook is more your style, you can log on to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash American Justice Podcast. Feel free to leave a comment, or you can message us on Messenger if you have a more pressing question or issue. If you'd like to blog about the show, you can log on to AmericanJusticePodcast.com and let us know what you think there. If you're a tweeter, you can also voice your opinion on Twitter, at A Justice Podcast. We would very much appreciate it if you could give us a five-star review on all the podcast streaming platforms. 